All right, in this next module, we're going to talk about the uh, choices available to you uh, in which you're able to tell ISIS how much ordering you need and how durable you would like data to be. You don't really need to make this choice as you initially build an ISIS application. I would recommend that most ISIS applications be built using ordered send. But the choice I'm going to talk about is important for performance. So as you remember, ISIS offers us groups of processes. You create a program instance, it joins a group, state is transferred to that group, after which it can begin to do multicasts. All right, and the functionality of ISIS is oriented around strong consistency while achieving fault tolerance, high levels of performance, very rapid response time and coordination, in which the local object is typically an application object coupled to a kind of a gateway into a group and you use an event-oriented programming style in which when you want to tell the group to do something you would typically send it a multicast or send it a point-to-point -point message you could do point-to-point -point messages to individual members and then an event up call occurs corresponding to the type of request you made the terminology that we're going to be using and I'll just review it quickly uh, you've heard it by now in in the introduction is a, a process group is our term for this kind of a grouping of, of application programs that are sharing information. The reason we say process group and not object group is because we want to remind you that the intended granularity is pretty coarse here. ISIS can allow a single program to join five or six of these groups. It won't be a problem. But if you tried to join thousands of them, you're going to overload the subsystem of ISIS that handles group membership. And so we're not recommending that you have one of these groups per object that you might have in an application. So we're calling them process groups. Um, messages which are sent uh, to carry the data. A multicast sends messages from one to n. Uh, a reply might be a one-to-one -one message. Right? State transfer is a term we've used to capture the idea of making a checkpoint and transferring it to a joining member of a group. Um, we've talked about updates and lookups, but really what we're doing in, in these modules is distinguishing between operations that change the shared replicated group state, all of those I'm going to kind of call updates, and operations which query it. And those can very often be done on any single copy. This isn't a system like the quorum replication systems you might have heard about in textbooks or other research papers. In ISIS, Every individual copy can be individually queried. So lookup operations can often be just performed by talking to some member of a group and it can just look at its own version of the data. Um, however, parallel lookups where you want everybody to participate and share in the workload, uh, those involve a multicast and multiple replies. And we'll talk about that. And a multicast, again, is just a message from one member to all the members of a group. Later we'll hear about cases in which you can also do multicasts to subsets of a group. And those arise in big data systems that use what's called sharding, where you break up a big data set into small subsets. But in general, in this module at least, multicast always means to all the members of a group. And so the example we've looked at and that we're going to continue to work with has some kind of an external client system, which is using some form of web communication, maybe RESTful RPCs or web services requests, uh, to talk to a server. And now we've taken that server and replicated it across multiple nodes in a data center or a cluster. And we're doing updates using multicast. And as I pointed out in the introduction, you actually have a set of choices. Here's a safe send being used. Uh, if you remember from the introduction module, safe send is ISIS's slowest and most conservative but strongest guaranteed primitive. Ordered send is one that you've seen in the introduction as well. I use it much more commonly. It's much, much faster, but only slightly weaker in its guarantees. And you've also seen mentions at least to, to raw send, send, which is FIFO, causal send, which has causal ordering. What exactly are these choices and differences? That's what I want to talk about in this module. So when we talk about multicast having properties, ISIS actually offers you a number of properties and guarantees associated with multicast. They relate to who will receive the multicast, how failure will be handled, how ordered the multicasts are relative to other concurrent multicasts, and how durable the multicasts are. And by understanding 
the meaning of these properties, you can configure ISIS to perform exactly the way you want it to for a particular application so that the application offers the level of assurance guarantees to its users that are required and doesn't pay for properties that aren't needed or perhaps even meaningful in a particular setting. That wouldn't be something you would worry about if the performance differences were very small, but as we're going to see, the performance differences are sometimes enormous. And with huge performance differences, these are choices that we really have to make carefully and intelligently. So let's start with some of the platform guarantees, and then we'll work our way down to multicast guarantees. And the first of the platform guarantees I want to talk about is what I call view ordering, and it relates to the idea that view up calls will be synchronized relative to message delivery. So let's look at some pictures, and I'm going to show you the same pictures again and again with the thinking that you get used to them, and we can focus on different elements of them. So this picture is what's called a virtual synchrony picture. You can see it for systems like Paxos as well, a state machine replication picture. Time here is going from left to right. And what you can see happening is that essentially one, ele one action, one event is happening at a time in this picture. So if I go from left to right, process P was launched on some node and it established some group. Later, Q was launched, and P might have a state associated with that group by now, and it transfers the state. That's the white arrow. Then some messages were sent from P to Q, and maybe Q responded. And uh, later, Q, R, uh, R, S, and T join the group, and we have to transfer state to them from probably P or Q. There's a way to choose who sends the state, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. And um, by default, it would be P, and a white arrow uh, represents the state transfer again, and this time the state transfer goes from P to multiple receivers. Then we have some multicast being done in the group by different members, and in this particular case, we have some failures that occur, and those failures happen at time 60 and cause the group membership to change and shrink after which at time uh, 65 or so, R happens to send another multicast. So we can look at that picture and we can say, what guarantees did ISIS provide? And the first of the guarantees relates to the way that ISIS notifies you about these membership change events, these views, um, as time evolves through the system and events occur. Now, in the physical network, in the real world, there's very little control over when a failure or a join might occur relative to multicast being sent initializations like state transfers. What's going to be happening here is that the ISIS platform hears about those events, think of them as raw events, and it delays delivering them until it has calculated an ordering which satisfies the properties of its model. It's like a sorting algorithm. It's got a bunch of events that it needs to report to the application, but it doesn't report them until it's decided what order to report them in. So ISIS knows that, that, that P and Q have failed, but it also knows that a multicast is pending, and it has the option of waiting to report the failure until after it's delivered the multicast, for example. And those kinds of choices that ISIS is making are visible to you as an application designer because you don't have to worry about things happening that ISIS rules out. And of course, you do have to worry about things happening that ISIS permits. So we need to understand what these guarantees really are. One of the most important guarantees is visible on this picture in the following way. When a multicast is done, it always occurs entirely between two different views, which means that every member of the group sees the multicast delivered in the same view. So for example, if I look at the multicast from process R to the other members that was sent at time 32 in this picture, you can see that the group at that point contains P, Q, R, S, and T, and that multicast will be sent to P, Q, R, S, and T, even though the application that sent it just said G dot ordered sent. It didn't really say, right now that's the membership. ISIS did that. And ISIS does that such that there's a meaningful sense in which that is the membership of this group at that time. Everyone is told the membership of the group. It's done through a view up call, but you can also ask what the membership is at any time you like. In particular, you can ask what the membership is when you get a message, and ISIS will give you back the current view. So the current view at the time of the delivery of this message is P, Q, R, S, and T. And in fact, in that order, everybody will see that P joined first, Q joined second, R, S, and T joined third. This will be view three of the group. 
Um, they all know their ranking in that group, which is ranked based on uh, when they joined. And then if a batch join all at once, there's just an ordering that ISIS imposes. You'll never get a message from a process that crashed. Look at this message that was sent at time 62 and delivered a little bit later at time 68 or so. That message could not, in ISIS, could not have been sent by P or Q. Any message that P or Q send in the group will have been delivered before P and Q failed and the failure was reported through a new view. So these are very strong guarantees, really strong guarantees. And a state transfer occurs after every multicast has been delivered for the previous view and before we start delivering multicasts in the new view, which means that we're at a point in time when the group is kind of idle and every single update that should have been applied has been applied. These kinds of guarantees really simplify your life as a developer because you don't have to worry about an update that reached some members but not others, uh, a multicast uh, that somehow is interfered with by a failure. Some of the members get it, some don't. ISIS fixes those problems, orders things, suppresses multicasts sent by the dead. We'll talk more about that later. It does all of this to make your life simpler as a developer. Okay, and we offer several implementations of multicast. The idea here is to allow you to keep your data consistent and allow you to do things in a consistent way, but at the lowest cost applicable in the given setting. So a multicast derives in the group, what information is the same for all recipients and what might differ for all recipients? This might be a good point to pause this video briefly and think about the answers to that. All right, well, let's take a look and see what the answers actually are. All the recipients of a group, if they call GetView, or if they made a note of what the view was the last time they got a view up call event, will actually see the same view information when the incoming multicast is processed. Everyone can assume that everyone else got the message. And everyone can assume that whatever the ordering associated with the sending of that message was, was correctly enforced by ISIS, you see? And the, these are examples of things which the state machine you implemented can take advantage of to consistently handle that incoming traffic. What might differ? Well, each of these members has its own rank in that membership view. And so if I'm process P, and I look up my rank in the view I was showing you, my rank will be zero. The rank is actually age ordered. If I'm R, S, and T, they're going to get ranks three, four, and five. Actually, four, uh, two, three, and four, because we counted from zero. I'm sorry about that. So two, three, and four. They all join in, at the third instance of time, and in that, there's just some sort of, a, of an, you know, an ISIS imposed random ordering on them in the picture I showed you, it was R, S, and T. So R will be two, S will be three. Now they can use that distinction that they all see the same view, but they each have different ranks to subdivide work in a nice way, in a consistent and coordinated way. Now what about failures? Let's pin down exactly what the issues are for failures here. Well, one issue is that if a failure occurs as a message is being sent, we have to worry about whether we should su suppress it entirely. Remember, I mentioned that if we've reported that P and Q have failed, a multicast that might show up somehow in the system from P and Q could confuse the processes in the group because they've already reacted to the failure. So one example of a guarantee ISIS has is it will never deliver a message to you after it's reported on a failure. Um, another guarantee it gives you uh, is that it will clean up partial deliveries and turn them into full deliveries after a failure. Now the issue is the following. At the time you issue a message, you don't really know what the state of the group actually is. You don't know what the view will be when the message is delivered because it could be in the process of handling failures or joins, in which case your multicast has to be done before or after the view change occurs. ISIS worries about that for you, picks an event ordering, and then delivers things. And as a result, although you can't guarantee what view your message will be delivered in, you can be guaranteed that if anyone gets the message, everyone gets it. 
they get it in a consistent order and if they think you failed they will not later get a message from you which is useful because it avoids a situation where someone who's not even in the group anymore tries to make the group take an action so here we have an example of a multicast that actually could have been sent prior to the membership change because in some sense the view event is a concurrent event from ISIS's point of view with the initial with the attempt to send this multicast it's up to ISIS which order to use so how can we be sure, for example, that, uh, that a query reflect results, uh, that the results of a query reflect answers from every member? This is confusing if you think about it, because when you send a query, you don't really know who will be in the group when the query is processed. So suppose you got back three answers. You wanted all answers to a query. And suppose you got back three answers. Would you know if that reflects an answer from every member? Well, you could say to yourself, doesn't it have to? But we know that every member will receive it, but what we don't really know is whether one of them might have crashed before it had a chance to reply. So if the group had five members, we had a group with five members, and the multicast for the query was received when the view had five members in it, if I got back three responses, that's quite possible for the picture we had previously. Uh, and that wouldn't be enough of the replies. I'd be missing two of the replies. So how can we tell? Well, in ISIS, what we do is the following. You actually need to figure the answer out and then tell the query caller. So you do know that everyone gets the multicast. One possibility is to say, well, the receivers all saw the view. When they reply, they shouldn't just send their contribution to the reply. They should also say, at the time I processed this, I was ranked two, and the view had five members in it. Now, at that point, you'll get kind of redundant information. Your replies will all say everybody's view had five members in it, but they'll have different rank numbers, which can be useful for sorting out who gave you the answer. And if you got the wrong number of answers, if the number of results isn't exactly the same as the members, the size of the group, you'll know that you're missing some answers. So that's one way to do it. Another way you can do this is this. At the time you sent the query, you didn't know who would be in the group at the time it was delivered. However, you yourself will receive this query. So in ISIS, the multicast goes out, but it also loops back and is delivered to you with the same ordering properties that everybody else sees. And so you could actually set your version of the query request handler to also make note of who was in the group at the time and somehow pass that information back to the place you did the call. That would work too. Personally, I think that that kind of code is kind of ugly, and the version where you include it in the replies is a bit easier. And by the way, you might be starting to wonder, how much do I know about this? Do I even know who sent a query? And I'll just point out here that the easiest way to do that is to just include the sender's address as one of the arguments. There is a way to do it. ISIS has some methods where you can ask it what the current message was that was just delivered to you uh, that it extracted those arguments out of g.car message will get it for you uh, and return it and then you can ask for the messages sender but I, I don't recommend going into that kind of deeper level if you want something like the address of the caller included just make it an extra parameter um, by the way uh, let's get back to this idea of uh, messages from the dead why did I emphasize that before and why is that a concern suppose I build a group in which there's some kind of a reaction to membership changing, such as P and Q failed, so I have to take over, R has to take over some role that P had. Maybe it's in charge now of monitoring the camera. All right, You don't want a situation where there are two operators in charge of the camera, for example. They might have different opinions about how to set the focus. So in that situation, P has lost that role, and R took it over. That's why you wouldn't really want messages from P delivered after P has been reported as failing. Now I'm emphasizing this because people who are watching this video who are familiar with Paxos might not be aware of it, but Paxos's way of doing dynamic membership changes, the membership change is reported first, but you might get messages from the failed processes, and you actually could get those messages much, much, much later. 
And you don't really know when that period has ever ended even. Now, ISIS, Paxos doesn't provide that guarantee. ISIS does, including in the ISIS version of Paxos, which is safe send, ISIS actually does provide that guarantee. You will never get a message from a process after we report it as failed. All right, so I found um, a book called Messages from the Dead. Uh, it looks like a really atrocious book, but you can buy it on uh, various websites. And you will never get messages from the dead in ISIS. In any situation where ISIS sees a message from a process that has left a group but is being sent to the group, that was sent into the system from a process that ISIS is reporting as having failed, ISIS will suppress that message. If you try to send to a group you've left, it'll throw an exception in your application program. If you're partitioned away from the system and then you manage to reconnect, ISIS will send your process an app, a message saying, I'm very sorry, but I've reported you as failed. And you would have to reboot ISIS in some sense on that machine in order to reconnect in. You wouldn't be able to continue to use ISIS as a member of the system after it thinks your process has failed. And this prevents kind of split brain behavior if you think about it. So now we can start to talk a little bit about ordering properties. And the one I want you to start by thinking about, because it's by far the most important, is what's called total ordering. And total ordering is evident in the same picture. This is simply the uh, guarantee that even if processes send messages concurrently, ISIS delivers them as if they were sent one by one in some order. And ISIS picks that order. If you actually send message A and then message B, ISIS will generally respect that ordering. And we can talk about cases where it might not, but they're very rare and they relate only to something called raw send. Okay, so in general, ISIS always respects the order you sent messages in, but it can go further and it can put messages in order even if different processes send them. And in this picture, we see that. We see here that Q sent message A and that T sent message B. Now, technically speaking, there may not be any guaranteed order between A and B. Perhaps they sent them at the exact same instant in time. But ISIS calculates an order. It sorts these kinds of messages in some sense. And it will put A before B or B before A unless you ask it not to bother to do that. The way you get total order in ISIS is by invoking the primitive ordered send or safe send. And we'll talk about the distinction between them later, but they have the identical ordering guarantee. So ordered send and safe send are two ways to be sure that concurrent multicasts are delivered in the same order at all recipients. They're also delivered to every member of the group, as we heard earlier. So in this picture, everyone gets A, then B. Now, there are weaker versions of ordering available, but you wouldn't necessarily want to jump to use them. They're intended to give you somewhat higher speed. But it turns out that ordered send usually can achieve the highest possible speed for a multicast system. And the only time in which ordered send is ever slower than the highest physically possible speed that a multicast system can get is specifically when the system notices that multiple group members are using ordered send concurrently in the same group in the same view. So if in the current view, all the sends are originating at one place, ordered send will actually give you the very fastest possible performance in that case. The one case to be concerned about then is if you're using multiple concurrent sends, then ordered send is a little bit slower than the fastest that's possible because it has to order those concurrent sends and decide should A be first and then B. It has to make a choice. That choice takes time. That time is reflected in ordered send being a tiny bit slower than the next fastest primitive, and I'll tell you about that now. In contrast, the other totally ordered primitive, the Paxos-based one called SafeSend, is much, much slower. It's slower for completely unrelated reason. It has nothing to do with ordering. SafeSend is slower because it has to log every message to disk, and we're going to talk about why in a few minutes when we talk about durability. Okay. So we have two ways to get strong ordering, and one of them is really very cheap and very fast, and that's ordered send. And the where I'm going to go in this module is I want to argue that for almost everybody using ISIS and for almost everything they do, they should use ordered send. I will tell you about other options, and they're useful for certain types of specialized purposes, but you've already heard the most important single takeaway from this module use ordered send, and life is very, very simple. Now, 
the case in which you can sometimes do a little bit better involves what's called FIFO ordering with concurrent senders. So as I said, with ordered send, the system actually optimizes for the case where there's only one sender sending in a particular group view anyway. However, suppose you had a situation where you had multiple senders. We can sometimes do a little better than what ordered send is doing if we know a lot about what the application is doing with the data. Now, here's an example. In this particular example, you can see that process P is the only sender of multicast. You may not notice it right at first glance, but take a close look and you'll see this isn't the same picture I showed you earlier. So earlier I had processes Q and T, I think we're sending multicast, but here I've changed it. Now, this could occur, if, for example, in a system where only the rank zero process is ever going to send updates to the data that we're pulling from some camera, but everybody else handles queries on the data, lookups. In that situation, you'd have all the updates coming from one process. Then maybe if that process fails, as we see here, some other rank zero member takes over, but only in that situation. It turns out that ISIS has a multicast primitive that's exactly matched to this pattern, and that's the primitive we call send. Send is FIFO ordered, meaning in the order multicast were sent. So in this particular case, we can see multicast being sent at time 12, at time 22, at time 38, at time 45. And that's the order in which they're sent. And send will respect the sending order as long as they were sent from the same source. So if P is the leader, for example, um, and the only time that leadership changes is when views change. Send is a perfectly good primitive. And the reason you might use send is because you're absolutely guaranteed to get that fastest physically possible performance with send. It guarantees FIFO order. It has all the other consistency properties of the ISIS optimistic delivery protocols. We'll explain what optimistic delivery is in a minute. There is something called raw send, which is even faster in certain circumstances, which are the following. If a message is, is lost, send and ordered send will reach send that message until it gets through. If you're doing real-time applications, there can be situations where you don't want retransmissions done at all. Raw send is send without that retransmission step. And so with raw send, if a message gets there, we deliver it right away. If it doesn't get there, we don't try to recover it. All right, so that's even a little bit faster if you want to think of it that way. The ordering property is exactly the same. It's still FIFO. However, if two processes concurrently use send in the same view, because send only guarantees FIFO ordering, they can interleave in any way at all. You could get AB at one node, BA at another. Um, so here's a picture like that. Uh, you have A and B are being sent here by Q and by uh, T in the same view concurrently. And as you can see, some members actually get BA, for example, P does, and some members get AB, for example, S does. So send, you are telling ISIS that that ordering is acceptable to you. Well, there are many applications where you really don't care about ordering, and in that case, you might, you might actually go ahead and use send. Uh, queries very often use send. If you just say query without saying what type of query, you'll get send for the multicast step of the query. Um, so send doesn't worry about ordering except in this FIFO sense. It's quite valuable. It is always the fastest physically possible way to send. It, it uses a, an IP multicast if that's an option, and it delivers immediately. However, in this kind of concurrent case, you could get inconsistencies if you're updating data at that point. And you'd have to think about whether that's a risk to you before you go and change something that used to use ordered send and switch it to try to use send. So when is FIFO good enough? An example would be, suppose the group manages a collection of data. And in a collection of data, each separate item has a leader, and all the updates for each separate item come from that item's associated leader. Well, in that particular situation, you'll get consistency as long as you apply the updates to an item in the order that the leader for that item said the updates occurred. Well, send has that property. Okay. However, again, keep in mind that multiple sends, so for different items in this particular example, might be delivered in some interleaved order, like the ABBA order we saw before. So if you ever were to look at several things at once, 
they won't necessarily be updated identically in that kind of a group. So you could use send in that situation if you knew what you were doing and you thought about it. You said, well, no, that's not a risk for me for this reason or that reason. Okay. But in general, ordered send would be only a tiny bit slower and would avoid that risk. So we give you this primitive because you might wish to use it. And then we caution you that you shouldn't use it unless you really understand the choice. If you understand the choice, you're perfectly safe making that choice. If you're not sure, stick with ordered send. Raw send, as I said, is even weaker. If you don't really care that every single update gets to every single group member, because freshness of data perhaps is much more important than reliability, well, raw send is available. So raw send is FIFO ordered and not reliable. No effort is made to recover things. Every message is delivered the instant it gets through. And the only guarantee it makes is that the messages will still be delivered in the order they were sent by the sender. It's just there might be gaps. So here's a, a, a picture that gives you uh, the list of orderings that we've talked about already. Uh, and associated with each one, I just wanted to point out, there's a corresponding kind of query. So there's a raw send, you can actually do a raw query. But some of the query responses may not come because the query might not reach everybody. Associated with send, ISIS offers a FIFO kind of query. Associated with ordered send, ISIS has an ordered query and safe send a safe query. In each case, what's really happening is the query starts by sending a multicast of the corresponding kind, and then it waits for replies. There's actually one more option in ISIS. You'll see it if you look in the user's manual. It's called causal send. And uh, we're including it for kind of academic reasons. If you're a student in this area, you'll have learned about Leslie Lampert's notion of potential causality. And causal send is using potential causality to order messages. It's very interesting if you're interested in the mathematical theory of this type of distributed multicast and reliable computing system. It's, it's used typically in situations where you have a notion of a leader, but the leader role moves around probably because you're doing locking or passing some kind of token. I had the lock, then I did some updates, then I passed it to you and you did some updates. In some sense, there's only one source of updates for these items at a time, but who sends the updates moves around within the system. Me, then you, then that other guy over here. So in these situations, causal send preserves the causal ordering. So let's go back to our AB case. Here we've got Q sending A, but hypothetically, suppose that Q passed some kind of lock or permission to T, and then T sent B. Now, in the picture I showed you earlier with send, if you remember, we had some guys getting AB and some getting BA. Causal send asks itself if the sender of B could have seen message A. Well, of course, in this case, the sender of B did see message A. It was delivered first. And causal send guarantees that any receiver of B will have received every message that the sender of B had received before it sent B. All right, that's confusing, so I should probably repeat myself. All right, so again, look at how A was sent by Q and received at T before B was sent. When B is sent, there's a kind of a race condition because processes R and S might not have gotten A yet. Think about a case where a was lost in the network and has to be resent, and it takes a whole second before it gets through. So maybe A is going to get delivered a long time from now. All right, and here comes B early. Now suppose that A, I don't know, it, it set up a, a new human resources entry in the database for me as an employee, and B lets me into the lunchroom. Well, if B shows up before I'm registered in the employees list, the lunch system might crash. It would say, what's the story? An authorization for a non-employee to get into the lunchroom, right? And so the idea here would be that you would like B to be delivered only after others have delivered A. And so causal send is capturing that notion of, of ordering, that A could have caused B to be sent, and so B should be delivered after A. You see? And so if, in fact, A was delayed getting to R, B will be delayed, held back at R, and delivered only after A has been delivered at R. And ISIS does that under the surface. And so causal send gives you this notion of, of, of enforcement of potential causality. Leslie Lamport showed how to formalize this. He introduced a, a, a causal arrow called happens before. You can see it here, where we would say um, A happens before B. And what that really means is A could have influenced B. Information from A could have flowed to B. 
causal send has a simple, concise way to track potential causality. And so if A happens before B, uh, a, a causal send includes some information in B, which allows ISIS to sense that and to delay B and deliver it after A, even if that might cause a long delay. But the ISIS implementation, I should probably warn you, isn't very optimized for this particular case. And so although in previous systems here at Cornell, we built very high performance versions of causal send, in ISIS 2, this is present mostly for academic fun for students who are doing projects where causal watering is important. If you really measure the performance of causal send, you'll see that you get a pretty substantial performance hit versus other ways of doing things. So it's there for fun, but it's not really a super high performance choice. What about durability? So durability gets us at this difference between what we're calling the optimistic protocols and the pessimistic ones, and really dominantly the difference between ordered send and what we're calling safe send. So a durability guarantee relates to the question of whether information associated with a group or a multicast survives failures. And I, I, I gave those two cases, a group or a multicast, because really there are two cases. One question involves whether the delivery of a multicast is durable, and I'm going to show you cases where even a multicast could vanish from a system. And the second relates to whether the data stored in the group is durable. Does the group itself remember the updates it got yesterday? Does it remember, does the database the group is managing remember the updates that happened yesterday? So you can imagine this whole succession of questions about durability. What happens with multicast durability? Are there cases where multicast can be sent and then lost? All right, we'll, we'll talk about those first. What happens with the state of a group? Could a group lose its state? Where would I get it back from? We'll talk about that. What happens if the group is managing this external database? Could the database lose an update? And we'll talk about that. All right? And as you know, jumping to the conclusion, safe send is for that database case, but it's way slow. And ISIS itself turns out to deal with the very first case, always. And you're only left really with the middle case, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so we've talked about some of these issues. What if the sender of a multicast fails? And I'll just remind you what we know. Uh, what we know is that if the sender fails, then ISIS will report the failure, and you'll never see any more messages from the sender. You might think that I've covered all the cases, but suppose that there's one more case to think about. And here, here it is. What if the sender fails, but ISIS has already delivered maybe one copy of the message? So hypothetically, P fails, but ISIS already delivered a message to Q. Should it deliver that message to everyone else? Here's the way that the deal is, is resolved in ISIS. If anyone got a copy of the message and is still in the group in the next view, ISIS makes sure everyone in the group got the message. And the way it does that is if P sends a message to Q, Q holds on to that message for a period of time after it delivers it, even in these very fast cases. The only exception is Ross end. Um, but in the, norm, in the normal cases, it holds on to a copy. And if P is reported as having failed, Q echoes the message out and says, oh, if P is failing, everyone should deliver this message. And that's done before the view is reported. There's like an internal stage of reporting a view. Uh, you can even actually get these reports if you want, where ISIS tells you it's going to change the view. And at that stage, the protocol implementing these multicasts echoes out any buffered messages. So the effect of that is that message delivery is all or nothing because even if P failed, Q took over its responsibility or R or S, anybody who had a copy of the message. Now, what if the sender sends a message and Q gets it, but then the sender and Q fail? Now, in this particular situation, we can ask if that message gets lost or not. Now, as I've described it, of course the message got lost. There aren't any copies of it anywhere else in the system. But you could imagine a different way of implementing multicast. And the way that would work is this. The sender would send a message, and until everyone confirmed they had a message, no one would be allowed to deliver it. Now, in that case, if I go back and repeat myself, the sender sent a message and one copy was delivered. Hey, no problem. Everybody else has a copy. We just have to tell everyone else to deliver it. So you can see that there are really two cases here. If the sender sends a message and the receiver re delivers it right away, we're much faster, but now we're at risk of this failure where the message is lost completely. If the sender sends the message and everyone kind of logs it, we can't lose the message, but we had to log it, confirm it, 
then allow delivery. A lot of time passed. We're way slower, but more robust. This durability distinction will turn out to be significant because that's going to be the difference between ordered send and safe send. Now, to understand why I had to make this distinction and when these choices apply, I'm going to pause very, very briefly and talk about the notion of soft state versus hard state. In the cloud, a very big development occurred 15 years ago when Eric Brewer, who I showed you on the introduction slide, pointed out that for very scalable settings, most applications only need what he called soft state. So by soft state, what he meant was you've got nodes and they have associated information, but after they crash, you can throw away the virtual machine, including any local files, and reconstitute it later if you feel like it. Even if you reran on the same machine, you would get clean, a clean virtual machine with clean local files. Files you created are gone. Any files that are present are what was ever in the virtual machine at the time you made the virtual machine. Now, in distinction, hard state arises if the node has permanent files available to it, like my real computer does, or perhaps if I put the files in a global file system of some sort. Eric pointed out that we could offer very, very cheap soft state nodes by optimizing all sorts of costs away that hard state nodes can't avoid. And this took off, and today on most clouds, the outer tier that has the very large numbers of computers in it is entirely soft state. If those nodes fail, when they recover, any information they had locally is gone. It's as if it was in memory on a program that crashed and then rebooted. Of course, that data is gone. Hard state is available in the cloud, but you pay much, much more for it. Okay, you might pay a dollar an hour for a node instead of a penny an hour. It's that type of distinction. So, lots of lots of applications try to be elastic by having immense numbers of replicas running in soft state. And the hard state tier of the cloud, the expensive tier of the cloud, is treated separately and is quite a bit more expensive. And the reason that we're making this distinction is because it's going to turn out that the cheaper ISIS protocols are a great match to the soft state tier of the cloud. And the expensive protocols, the Paxos equivalent protocols, are a good match to the expensive tier of the cloud. And that's the distinction that we need to get used to. So durability for soft state will, will work best with ordered send using something called uh, the group flush primitive, g.flush. And durability for hard state will work best with a Paxos style protocol, safe send, but you'll have to use it in a very, very careful way. And that's always true of Paxos, although many people who have read about Paxos don't realize how hard it is to use Paxos. Uh, my colleague Robert Van Renesse wrote a wonderful paper called Paxos Made Moderately Complex. I highly recommend it. There are lots of papers called Paxos Made Simple. None of them talk about how to use Paxos. Paxos Made Moderately Complex is a little bit more, more detailed about what the challenges are for you as a user of Paxos instead of the builder of Paxos. And you find quite a different picture, and it's the same picture that we have in ISIS. It's the same features, actually, that make safe send hard to use and more complicated. So multicast durability, then ISIS is always offering an all or nothing guarantee. Either every group member receives your multicast and no group member loses it, or no group member receives your multicast, and that's true even if the sender fails midway through. But as I pointed out, that sender didn't really tell us what happens if a sender fails and a group member fails, and the group member had a copy of the multicast when it failed. So the distinction there is this one I've called optimistic versus pessimistic. The optimistic protocols, and in ISIS those are send, raw send actually also, but send, causal send, and ordered send. These protocols all deliver a message the instant it's possible to do so. So the message is sent, arrives in a receiver, he unpacks it, delivers it. All right. Now, we're not in a very safe state. If the sender and the receiver both crash, the message is wiped away. That's what makes these optimistic. It's an optimistic delivery, but it's very fast. It might be literally tens of microseconds if your network is very fast. So they're delivered on, receiver, on receipt, but you're at risk for a brief period of time. An optimistic protocol will still look all or nothing in ISIS because after a crash, ISIS checks to see if the surviving members have any extra messages to deliver, and it echoes them out and it delivers them. 
The bad case is always the case where the sender fails and everyone who has gotten the message has also failed. This sounds like a poison pill message, but it would also arise if the sender and the, and the receivers were partitioned and didn't know it yet. The network's still working between them. So the sender sends a message the receiver receives. It's all perfectly reliable. The sender is struggling to try to get his messages across the partition. And ISIS is actually in the process of deciding that that sender and that receiver are dead. Sooner or later, ISIS will make that decision, and it will cut them off completely. And that message the sender was sending will never make it across, because now that sender has become a failed processor. And remember, ISIS doesn't deliver messages from the dead. But ISIS already did deliver that message, and that's the consideration that arises with these optimistic deliveries. In some sense, the message was delivered from P to Q. P has a copy. Q delivered it. But now it's been forgotten by the system. It's developed amnesia. So this raises a kind of question with optimistic delivery. What if uh, something wrong with that picture? Okay. What if a tree falls in the forest and no one heard it? So here's that optimistic picture. You can see I've got message A being sent and B, and those are kind of normal, and they're going to get to everybody. And in fact, in a way, we're actually going to pretend that message B reached the members that have failed because we're going to deliver message B in a view where the group had five members, but as you can see, P and Q have become partitioned away, and we're going to later decide they failed. They never really will see that message. We'll just lie about it. We'll say, hey, B, B was delivered atomically, then they died and went away. Hey, it's soft state. There's no record of their state after they crash. There's no proof that that was true or false. <laughs> this is impossible to answer that question. Did that tree make noise in the forest? Who knows, right? So consider messages B and C here. B and C have a different problem. B, first of all, is lying about whether it got to, to P and Q. We're acting like it did. But in addition, we've got message C, which is getting delivered, and it's never going to get to anybody else. These are both examples of messages where, in some sense, the ISIS illusion of virtual synchrony um, is, is sort of camouflaging a dirtier reality where P and Q actually did process message C, and furthermore, they never even got message B. And nobody else ever hears about C, but they do process B. So let's ask ourselves, when would anyone notice that inconsistency? And I hope what you're thinking to yourself is, well, you remember those pictures with the fellow sitting on the left? If P or Q talked to an outside, like an air traffic controller, they might notice that inconsistency because maybe P and Q were in a state where C was an important message and, and they said, yes, it's safe to fly the plane into this. And, and now we've sort of gotten a split brain situation. So here's where this notion of flush enters. If you call g.flush before talking to the outside world, it pauses briefly until your messages have been fully delivered. Now, by the time your message has been fully delivered, these transient scenarios we're talking about have already ended. Your messages have been fully delivered. But there's another way they can end. You can imagine P or Q calling flush and pausing briefly. And while that pause has occurred, this partition forms. And eventually, P and Q get told, I'm really, really sorry, but you've been dropped by the system. And they never do get a chance to talk to that external guy because the flush never did come back. Instead, an exception got thrown, a partitioning exception. That's how ISIS handles optimism. It lets you get fast early deliveries, but it gives you this protection against talking to the outside world while you're in an unsafe state. And so optimistic delivery is fastest. But the price is you have to use g.flush. And now let me explain what the form, uh, what the k is for. What g.flush with this k parameter does is it waits until your message has been delivered to everyone else. And the broader way to express this is any messages you've received or any messages you've sent are in a temporarily unstable state until they've reached every destination. And then they garbage collect themselves out of the system. g.flush waits for that garbage collection to occur. And g.flush of k waits until every message that this node knows about, this process knows about, has been acknowledged by at least k receivers. The thinking is the odds of two failing is really low. Three, it's insanely low. 
that's just not going to happen simultaneously. If a message has reached three recipients, it's everywhere. And if it's not everywhere, the recovery mechanisms will get it there. So the idea with G.Flush of K is that you say to ISIS, I'm going to talk to the outside world, and I'm kind of nervous about the state I'm in, flush. And when that flush comes back, you don't have to be nervous anymore. The state you're in is the same state everyone else is in. And a value of K of three, or a little more than three, four, gives you really very, very strong guarantees. Even two, frankly. You're left with that tree fell in the forest, did it make a noise? But the answer is no one heard the noise. The guys who saw that extra message delivered didn't talk to the outside world about it. Then they failed. Soft state, right? It got wiped out. And the memory of what happened is erased. Whether they saw the message or didn't see the message, no one knows and no one cares. The system essentially rolled back. It's as if we optimistically delivered and then we rolled the state back by erasing it, by crashing it. So the tree has become the delivery of a message, but the story is the same. So when do you call g.flush? The answer is, if you're using the optimistic primitives, and we are recommending that you use g.ordered send, you're going to call g.flush with a value like 2 or 3 before you talk to something outside that soft state tier of the cloud, basically outside this process, other than the local file system, because the local file system is part of its soft state. So you'll certainly use it before you talk to that fellow who was sitting off on the left. That flush barrier could delay, and while it delays, your node could crash. But if it didn't crash and flush comes back to you, at that point, it's perfectly safe to send that guy a reply. Other things may have come in, but they hadn't come in at the time of the flush, and so whatever you're prepared to send him as a reply is safe to send him. Now, the pessimistic version of delivery essentially integrates the flush with the send operation, and you end up with safe send. But it's even worse than that, because safe send is a kind of a two-phase commit that actually creates a database of pending messages. And here's how it works. You get a message that's going to be sent, and safe send gives it to the potential recipients and says, don't deliver this yet. Log it, please. And they log it. They actually log it to disk unless you don't set it up that way. But you really should set it up that way. So the, they log it to disk. There is this case where they log it in memory, but you probably wouldn't want to use it because there's no real setting that needs it, it turns out. It's just offered as a feature if you want it. And when everyone says, yes, my message is logged on the disk, at that point, there's no need for a g.flush because this message is definitely at all its recipients. Then you start to authorize them to deliver it. And so that time that passes slows this protocol down a lot. But the advantage is that you don't have to worry about that tree flush if it fails in the, you know, falls in the forest because it just doesn't ever happen. So where's this durable state? As I said, uh, if, if you use safe send without configuring it properly, without giving it this disk logger feature and telling it where to put the log, safe send actually is kind of half broken. It's not really Paxos at that point. At that point, it, it, what it'll do is it'll log in memory, but it won't have it on the disk. Uh, and there would be a case where you could notice that, which involves a node crashing, recovering, and not knowing the same state as everyone else. If you use safe send the way it's intended to be used, you have to configure this thing called the disk logger. It involves two extra system calls to ISIS. And when you do that, that durable state is actually physically in a database that we maintain in ISIS on the disk. We actually make multiple copies of that database, one for each of the members of the group that are accepting this message in that stage. And all of those copies are giving us this very strong guarantee. Now, I should mention at this point that this starts to raise a question of storing the state of a group. Because as I mentioned at the very beginning, there really are other cases. The state of a group can be in memory in soft state. The state of the group can be checkpointed. And I haven't told you how to do that, but that's actually the most useful place to put the state of the group, really. The group won't forget its state if you checkpoint it. And then the last case, in some sense, is the state is in this external MySQL database or an Oracle database or some other place in the global file system. Safe send is oriented towards that last super expensive case, and it works well for it. But checkpointing into a, a durable checkpoint is actually a perfectly good place to keep the durable state of a group, and it's cheaper. You can use that with ordered send. 
So should you always use safe sand? If you could, if it was cheaper, I guess the answer is maybe you could argue that you should use it. It's very hard to use it properly though. I think what you should always use is g.ordered send plus g.flush with a value of k like two or three. That's my opinion. That's easy to use, very robust, and if you want durability for your group, you can just use the checkpointing feature, and I'm going to show you how that works in a second, and that'll make the group durable and it's easy to use. Safe send is quite a pain to configure properly because of this issue of the disk logging feature and makes an awfully large number of copies of things. Now, I have to give another sidebar about Paxos here for people who know about Paxos because Paxos has an important parameter and those people are going to be asking themselves, where's the parameter? It's called the Paxos acceptor count. So Paxos has a, a parameter associated with it, which tells how many participants are needed in the two-phase commit. And the way Paxos is designed, at least half the group has to respond, and those are called the acceptors. And the rule is that a quorum of acceptors must acknowledge each message. You can actually set the number of acceptors required in ISIS as well. And so in this first phase, when you log and respond, the number of responses you're expecting, that's the, the, the acceptor threshold. So our version of Paxos uh, has this thing called a set a, a safe send threshold, and you can set a value in it, and that tells us what you want this Paxos acceptor count to be. And if you do that, that's how many logs we create. And so, for example, if you use K half the member of your group or all the members of your group, we will create that many disk logs, each one of which contains all the messages that are being delivered in this group in this two-phase stage of, of delivery. So if you think about it, if you have a group with k2 or 3 and you use g.ordered send and then g.flush, you get this slightly optimistic delivery, but you know that you've got two or three copies. And if you had Paxos, you could do the same thing and set k to 2 or 3 in ISIS with the safe send threshold. You'd have two or three copies, but it turns out that would not really be the true Paxos properties as Lamport defined them because there'd still be this corner case where those two or three guys manage to crash in a correlated way, but the rest of the group stays up. So if you're really interested in using Paxos, you generally shouldn't play with this parameter. You leave it at the default value. All the members of your group will log copies, which is definitely the majority. And in ISIS, that is the correct way to use SafeSend as Paxos. But here's what happens now. In this graph, we measured the performance of send, not even ordered send, but remember that send and ordered send behave the same unless you have multiple users of ordered send. So this would also be ordered send for many cases. And we've done it for a group of up to 600 members, really quite a lot of replicas. And the embedded little graph is showing you behavior for very small numbers of members, and then the bigger graph is showing you what happens as the group gets bigger. And the number of members is always the x-axis, Right? So it's really the same graph, just a blow up of a small pointer. And the, the, the y-axis here is how long between when a multicast is sent had to elapse before delivery really occurred. So what you can see is that when you use these optimistic early delivery protocols, let's look over here in smaller groups of up to 50 members. And this, by the way, wasn't even a very fast network or very fast machines. I could probably do 10 times faster on fast machines with InfiniBand. But notice that we're getting latencies of just a couple of milliseconds before the message is delivered. Three, five, and with InfiniBand, it would probably be, I don't know, 30 or 50 microseconds. In contrast, the two-phase commit required for SafeSend, for Paxos, is causing really big latencies because of this delay while we log data to disk and so forth. The red bar here is showing safe send where we've set that value of k to 3, which as I pointed out isn't even a safe thing to do. If you really want this to behave like Paxos, you have to use the green case where safe send is using all the members as its acceptors. And that's because the ISIS version of Paxos, it's really an all or subset thing, but if it's a subset, you lose some safety. I know that in real Paxos, it's just any quorum, but in ISIS, it's an all or nothing kind of thing. All right, so safe send, which is still, still giving you slightly stronger guarantees, is really getting slow. And look how slow it gets when groups get big. I mean, we're talking here about delays of a second or more before a delivery can occur. That's terrible. 
Nobody's going to put up with a one second delay. So what this is telling us is that we can use a system like ISIS to make replicas of a database like MySQL or Oracle, and we would do that using SafeSend, but we shouldn't make more than a couple of replicas. You can see that at, at, at maybe three replicas, we're getting acceptable performance. But frankly, beyond three, all of these graphs are just unacceptable except the blue bar. The blue bar ordered send or send with a flush is actually doing pretty well, even in larger groups. And as I said, if you have larger groups but a faster interconnect, these numbers drop quite a bit. All right. Now, I will comment that there has been some work at Microsoft using Paxos with a RAM disk architecture where they get slightly better numbers than I'm showing you here. This was still using a rotating disk, and a rotating disk has higher latencies. So if you're in a situation where you're running safe send on a RAM disk, you might actually be able to get away with larger groups using safe send. But it's still a two-phase protocol, and you get the network delays. It's still going to be pretty slow. The other difference that you're going to see is this. This is showing the variation from the mean. So, so on the previous slide, I showed you the average latencies. This is showing you the full histogram, worst case to best case. And what it does is it centers the average is zero. This particular one is for 32 member group. And you can see that for uh, send plus flush, we get really a pretty tight range of latencies. So the messages come through in a kind of real time fashion. Whereas for the different uses of safe send, we get this huge latency spread, meaning some messages get through faster, but others come through in much, much later. And in fact, if you really check, the ones that come through faster come in bursts. So you get this very bursty, irregular, and sometimes extremely slow delivery. I cut this off at 300 milliseconds, but it, for 300 milliseconds for a 30 member group, that's really not very good. So I don't actually recommend using SafeSend unless your group is only going to have three or five members, frankly. Um, and this is one reason why I went to all the trouble of teaching you about optimism and ordered send and the use of flush. Realistically, at cloud scale, we have to use this slightly more complicated approach of ordered send and flush because we just can't use the ultra safe safe send. Even a single multicast might delay our system for seconds at really big scale. This is showing you how long you wait for that G dot flush as a function of how big K gets. And what you can see is that when K is smaller, so the blue line here is three, and the and I told you three is probably big enough, and the red line is five. Um, the flush is really pretty fast. This is what's called a cumulative display uh, um, delay uh, distribution. It's showing you flush latency in milliseconds. It's running at around three to five milliseconds for blue and pushing its way up to about 10 milliseconds for red. And what percentage of the flushes have completed by that amount of milliseconds? And so, for example, 60% of flushes have completed, if you use k equals three, within about three milliseconds. And if you went with k equals five, 60% is pushing its way out to about 12 milliseconds. And if you use k, Closer to the full size of your group, you might see something like the green and black bars, which is for 48 members and then for 192 members. You can see that now flush is taking a long time. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't use those values. I, I, would, I would stick with K at 3. Okay. Uh, so there are several ways to make data durable. Um, and at this point, we know what they are. I just want to show you how to make a checkpoint. This is easy, and we'll go quickly on it. So to make a group durable using checkpointing, what you're going to do is set up these state transfer checkpoint routines. I'll show you them in a second. At which point, if you simply ask ISIS to store the checkpoint in a file by giving it a file name, and you do that by calling g.persistent, uh, persist, uh, giving it this global file name, it'll make one file log its state periodically. You can control when it does that. There's some parameters for that. Um, and at that point, on restart from a total failure, we'll reload the state from that file. Uh, in contrast, another way to do it would be to store your state in an external database. But then, as we're going to have to discuss a little bit more, we have to deal with the replay of safe send messages that have been logged by the group but haven't yet been applied to the database. It gets complicated. Um, and this disk logger is where it's like a persistent checkpoint, but it's where ISIS is keeping those two-phase messages in the first phase before the second phase delivery has occurred. 
uh, and what happens there is that they end up in this log and what ha and then when you restart for example if you're replicating SQL when you restart the replica and you restart SQL you've got to make sure that everything in that log is in SQL so you're gonna have to and so what ISIS will do is it'll replay everything in that log and then you reapply it to SQL. This is not trivial to do. This is why I was saying that Van Renesse's paper on Paxos made moderately uh, complex. These are things you have to deal with with Paxos. Paxos is moderately complex. So here you've got the case where you do use Paxos, and that's where you've got the database, and it's really external to the group. And the case that I prefer far, by far is what did send or send, this one shows send, stayed in this soft tier replica, uh, approach in memory or in local files and then calling g.flush uh, it didn't show it with three here but using something like three as the argument to g.flush um, and then you can reply pretty safely to your external client because the only situation where g.flush.k would reveal the optimism would be if those if the sender and those three acknowledged recipients all simultaneously failed before anyone else got the message and that just doesn't sound very plausible to me um, so, so actually, let's just think about this to make sure you understand why I'm saying it's so expensive. Suppose we did use safe send, and suppose we had four group members and they're all acceptors. You send one message. How many disk writes occur? Would you pause for a second and think about that? Okay. Well, the answer is going to be at least four because all the acceptors had to have a locally logged copy of the message in the first phase, and probably more like eight because when you talk to the up the database itself, the database has to be updated too. All right? This will really impress girls at a party, tell them that you've figured this out. All right, so the durability method feature of, of SafeSend has to do with telling ISIS where to put those Paxos logs, those SafeSend logs. They have to be in files and you've got to give us the file name. And so what you do is you call this thing called set durability method and you tell it to use the disk logger and you tell the disk logger what file to use. Uh, I, I've got a fragment of the code to do that in the ISIS manual, but it didn't fit nicely on this slide. So you probably want to copy that code out of the ISIS manual. And then what's going to happen is you're going to, as I said before, when, when you recover from a failure, an acceptor will end up replaying the messages in the log, it turns out, and it has to reapply them. And you've got to be able to tell if the database already has the messages in it. It's already done those updates. And that's your job, by the way. You'll have to figure out how to tell if the database has already performed this action. And only with all of that stuff in place will you be able to successfully replicate Oracle or MySQL using a system like ISIS. It can be done. You have to design essentially what you would call an item potent database system, but it's not the world's easiest thing to do. So it's harder to use and it's slower. So to recap, if your application maintains data purely inside the members of the group, just use these optimistic methods. I recommend ordered send and use flush. Use checkpointing to a log with this g.persistent feature if the group state is supposed to survive complete shutdowns. I'll show you how in just a second. And switch to safe send if you're really truly replicating a database. So how do you make these checkpoints? This is the easiest part of this little module. Um, remember, you need them for state transfer, and you need them for durability if you're using that durability feature. It's the same functionality, though. You register a method that makes the checkpoint, and here's how you do it. White arrow is the checkpoint. You write modules like this. You register a checkpoint maker, and you can actually register a few of them. And what ISIS is going to do is when it needs to make a checkpoint, it's going to do up calls to these routines. And all these routines do is they write the data by calling g.send checkpoint and specifying the data. You can have comma, you know, i, comma, j, comma, as much as you want there. I have two calls here. The one recommendation I would make is that uh, a single call should generally not send like gigabytes of data any. It's way better if these calls are limited to say half a megabyte at the most, maybe smaller things. Um, in this particular case, it's storing an int and a double and doing two calls, that's silly. Okay, and then what'll happen is you'll get a corresponding call to the loaders, which you see down below here, for each one of those calls to make the checkpoint. And then if it's a state transfer, make checkpoint will be called in the rank zero member of the group. You can override that. There's a way to tell ISIS that you'd prefer that the make checkpoint was called somewhere else. And if instead if it's for checkpointing to the disk for durability, um, then uh, ISIS will still call it, but rather than delivering it to the receivers, which it does for the state transfer, it just writes it to the disk. 
And then after a, a, a total shutdown of the group, the first guy that recovers checks for this durable checkpoint and reloads it and it calls those same load routines. Okay. Uh, and the only difference really is that if you want the group state durably checkpointed, you just add this one call to your setup where you say my group dot persistent and you give the file name, which is where we're going to keep that durable log. And it should be on a global file system or someplace that's durable that'll still be there if the group has a total shutdown. This is quite useful if you're building a group in the soft state tier because what it means is that even though you're in the soft state here, you can have a checkpoint of the group that's not soft state, and then you'll reload it after recovery. Uh, and we had two loaders, because ISIS is polymorphic, and it gives you an easy way to, to load stuff of different types. Okay. And it's, uh, as I said, using checkpoints for state transfer. Uh, so in this case where you have a checkpoint, what's going to happen is that when someone joins, the make checkpoint routine is called, and then the load checkpoint routine is called in the joiner. Um, so, so now this is going to raise an interesting question for you. How can you tell why your checkpoint was getting made? Um, and it turns out that you don't normally need to tell. The same state is typically being transferred for state transfer that you're going to want to store into a durable checkpoint file. So what are these checkpoints for? They're really only for these two cases. Um, now, the, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is this kind of scenario. Suppose that a group has a very large amount of associated state. So suppose that, that I have to transfer two gigabytes to these joining members. What would I do in that case? It's going to take a long, long time. So what we have uh, for you in ISIS, and we'll talk about it separately later, is a way to transfer data out of band. It's called the out of band or OOB tool. And what you can do is pre-transfer that information, and then the checkpoint only has to transfer the delta. So here's how a pre-transfer works. I don't know why these are building in the wrong order. So in this picture, we pre-transfer the gigabytes before our s and try to do their join. Now, of course, some updates could still occur, but the guess would be just a couple of them. And so now, the state transfer only needs to include the tiny little delta. All right. So this works really well, and you use this thing called the ISIS OOB file transfer tool to transfer those gigabytes. Um, the only issue now is how do you get a state transfer to know that you already had part of the data? And so the way you do this is this. You pre-transfer your data, and you're supposed to have some kind of a number that your application uses to indicate how much data was pre-transferred. Let's say that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is the number, representing, I don't know, how many updates that pre-transfer represented. And then what you do is when you call join, you specify that offset. And that offset shows up in the view that's passed to these load checkpoint routines. I could go back and show you, but if you go back and look at them, the load checkpoint, the make checkpoint routine receives the new view, the future new view as an argument. It's allowed to use it to see who's joining. And in there is a thing called v.offset, which is this value. So if you passed in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the guy making the checkpoint can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and he can say, oh, you only need to know about, you know, this tiny little delta. Maybe it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 through 1, 2, 3, 4, 8. So if your data is represented in a form where you can transfer a tiny delta, now you pre-transferred all that data, the group stayed alive, it wasn't disrupted, and then you transfer this tiny additional amount and the guy's up. So that's what we recommend. And on the other hand, zero would be passed in for that offset when we're checkpointing to a file or when um, nobody specified an offset value in the join. Right? And the state transfer itself occurs. Let's just build this virtual synchrony picture again. So virtual synchrony broadly lets you think about your application as a single non-replicated service, gives you a way to create this state machine replicated synchronous execution that we've talked about, and we understand that by now, and then allows, in fact, uh, other kinds of events with optimism, as we've discussed. Well, the idea here is that because of the scheduling behavior that ISIS has, it can make sure it's finished the delivery of all messages that are supposed to be delivered prior to the, to the state transfer. Then state transfer occurs, and that's the moment when your checkpoint maker routine will get called. Time elapses, of course, and then we deliver the, the checkpoint to the new member and time elapses. But we kind of hide that in the model and pretend that in one instantaneous swoop, state was created and it was transferred. And you don't have to think about the fact that we hit it because it, it sure looks like that. And then the system resumes and everybody's in the same state as they move forward. 
So state transfer seems to occur at the instant that the new member was in the changed view. And it's very safe, and you'll get a consistent uh, cut. And, and you can even specify who will send the state, if that's what you'd like. It's called the checkpoint chooser. All right. Last topic I want to cover briefly is how queries handle failures. So we have these queries, right, and, and people send replies. But what happens if you didn't get the correct number of replies? Now, I alluded to this at the very beginning of this module, and I just wanted to be systematic and explain it. So first of all, I wanted you to know that there are several ways to send replies. G.reply sends a reply, but you can actually say G.null reply, which means that this particular member deliberately wants ISIS to know that it doesn't plan to reply. It's not going to participate. And, and what happens is a tiny little message is sent back saying member 15 isn't going to reply. You can do something less safe. You can actually say g.no reply, but we don't recommend that. That says, I'm not going to reply. Don't worry about it. Uh, the reason is that if you forget to reply, ISIS automatically sends a no reply. And the only time it doesn't is if you said no reply. That's risky because you could left, leave the caller stuck waiting and he'll time out eventually. But if you know what you're doing, it's in there. And I use it internal to ISIS in a couple of places. And the other option is you, if something's really wrong, like you got a, a query and you can see that there's a mistake of some kind, you can actually send an abort reply. Very often I use that if processing the query through an exception in my receiver, I'm mad at my sender at that point. He sent me a bad argument. I'll force an abort to get sent, to, to be thrown on my sender by sending back an abort reply. It's the main use of that. And then the other thing you can do is there's a way in a query, I won't show it to you right now, to specify a timeout value and a behavior to occur. So with a query, you can say that if a timeout of, say, 20 milliseconds, I don't recommend it be that small, maybe like three seconds, occurs. You can auto send a null reply. You can kill off the guy who didn't reply. Or you can auto generate an exception. All right. And then I'll just remind you of what we talked about earlier. To sense missing replies, what we recommend is that the receivers of the query send back how many members were in the group, plus maybe their own rank, when they send back the reply. And that way, if you got five replies but would have expected to have gotten eight replies, you can tell. So to lecture summary here, um, ISIS is giving a lot of control over consistency and durability. Some of the features that ISIS provides are built into the platform, and they're really, really powerful, and they simplify your life a lot, like no messages from the dead, the ordering of views relative to multicasts, the cleanup after a failure, so multicasts are all or nothing. Others are a little more subtle, and you have to tell us what you want by specifying the level of ordering you like, whether or not to use an optimistic versus one of these very pessimistic protocol configurations. And in the pessimistic cases, you have to go even further and start to tell us where to log the data. And you're going to have to deal with replays, which really is not so simple. Um, however, it's giving you control over all of those features. And that's enough to build really quite a range of very powerful systems optimized for different use cases. And we'll stop at that.